Hello, hello, hello. Uh, it's Charles Darwin here. Now, uh, many of you may have heard of me. Uh, as you know, I am a genius uh, because uh, I came up with the concept of evolution via natural selection. Uh, and let's face it, it's one of the most brilliant ideas that anyone has ever come up with. And if anyone is a genius, then it is me. But one of the things that always irritated me my entire life <clears throat> was that already in my 20s, I started going bald. And in those days, I mean, it was the 19th century, for God's sake, so in general, chaps wore hats. But, you know, you take them off indoors, and then other friends of mine, you know, such as Thomas Huxley, had, had, had luscious heads of hair. And I was always rather embarrassed by the fact that I was bald. But now I discover a fascinating paper by Dmitry van der Linden et al, which kind of makes sense of what's going on. My baldness is an external expression of my genius. And so that's what we're going to look at on The Jolly Heretic today. Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of The Jolly Heretic. Now, today I would like to talk about... Uh, something so someone said to me uh, 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 in response to my last video, my video on genius and the psychology of genius, that I should look into the issue of baldness, and that is what I propose to do. In essence, I have a theory which I would like to... <coughs> I haven't tested it, but I, uh, my theory is this. Baldness should be associated with genius. Uh, it, you, you can think of various geniuses who are bald, such as Charles Darwin, such as James Watson, um, there are such as Francis Galton, um, there are pe people who are prematurely bald and who are geniuses. And I suggest that bald people should be overrepresented for their age among those who are geniuses. And I would like to explain why. Now, first of all, remember from the last video what a genius is. A genius combines outlier high intelligence, that is to say normally intelligence of above 130, with a certain personality type which is conducive to coming up with highly original, groundbreaking stuff. The genius will be relatively low in conscientiousness, that is to say impulse control and rule following, and this permits him to think outside the box, to make unusual connections, to think things that are literally unthinkable for most people, such as the idea that uh, humans were not uniquely created by God in Victorian England in 1859. Um, secondly, they are relatively low in agreeableness. Agreeableness is aspects of um, basically altruism, that is that you, you, you you are concerned about the feelings of others and you want others to be happy, and of empathy, which is that you understand the feelings of others and you are able to anticipate what those feelings will be. Um, and geniuses may also be relatively high in aspects of neuroticism, that is to say, feeling negative feelings strongly, though this could be caused by the other two. Now, other studies have found, studied by, for example, uh, uh, Felix Post, found that geniuses are elevated in aspects of psychopathology, and this is seen in their private lives, uh, and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and also that there are other studies indicating that they are elevated in aspects of autism. Now, these, this crosses over with the personality uh, profile, which I just mentioned. People that are autistic are, are, are average, obsessed with systematizing. They're very high in systematizing. They take in lots of information. Uh, this allows them to better solve problems, but they are relatively low in empathy, in effective empathy, in empathy whereby they are relatively low in being able to anticipate what other people will think. Um, <clears throat> and therefore they won't really realise that their radical new idea will offend people. And so, what, uh, and also there's elements of ADHD involved in genius, and an element of that is that you don't concentrate very well, but when you do concentrate, you concentrate severely and you kind of focus in on something. And also autism involves obsessiveness and therefore a desire to solve a problem and to not, not, not get knocked back and to really, really go for it. So this is the, the personality profile of, a, of the genius type. We're talking about autism, we're talking about psychopathology, uh, and, and so the, the master switch, as it were, which can be seen to underpin this is testosterone. 
because testosterone androgens male hormones because androgens are um cause you to be uh more impulsive they cause you to be a risk taker they cause you to be competitive they cause you to be uh basically less altruistic um androgens are associated with autism people that on average are, who are higher in autism traits are more masculinized and they're, they're basically higher in uh, in androgens, um, the people that are psychopath high in psychopathology, that is an expression of, of, of these various traits which, which can be seen to be underpinned by androgens. So the key thing, to a certain extent, it's simplifying it obviously, but the key thing then is basically testosterone. So what you would predict is that what a genius would be, would be somebody that combines outlier high intelligence with basically relatively high levels of testosterone. Whereas, by contrast, the average scientist is going to have normal range high intelligence, probably combined with low testosterone, because being a scientist compared to being an artist is associated with high agreeableness and is associated with high empathy and it's associated with high conscientiousness. But the genius is different. He combines the outlier high intelligence with these traits. And what that means, of course, um, is that he can think outside the box and whatever, high in low in conscientiousness, and also that he, he either won't care that his new idea will offend people or he simply won't be able to anticipate that it will. And, of course, it may also mean, because of the obsessiveness of autism and so forth, that he just thinks, he just reasons, that this, that even if he understands it will offend people, and even if he um, cares about the fact that it will offend people, he will just regard the truth, uh, systematising whatever, as more important. So that's the kind of person that we're dealing with. Now, on that basis, you would expect there to be, when you control for intelligence, you would expect there to be an association between intelligence and testosterone. And this is exactly what we found. There was a paper by Dimitri van der Linden, myself and Guy Madison called National Level Indicators of Androgens are Related to the Global Distribution of Scientific Publications and Science Nobel Prizes in the Journal of Creative Behaviour in 2020. And we took a number of national level markers of testosterone uh, these were androgenic hair, specifically mid-pelagial hair, so that is that you have hair on this part of the finger here, um, uh, CAG length on androgen receptor alleles, so there's certain alleles that are androgen receptors, uh, and uh, so and the length of them, the, the longer that allele is, uh, the more um, testosterone basically a person will, will, will tend to have. Prostate cancer, this is associated with testosterone. Uh, male and female 2D, 4D ratio, that's the difference between this finger and this finger. So 2D, 4D ratio. And if, if, if it's a small difference, then that implies a high level of testosterone. And if it's a big difference, that implies uh, a low level of testosterone. Uh, frequency with which people have sexual intercourse. And and the number of sexual partners across the lifespan. And we found uh, that these create what we can call a general factor. Uh, they, 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 they correlate together. So we can talk about there being a general factor of testosterone, a general factor of D of T, a general factor of androgens. Uh, we further found that the number of publications, of scientific publications, and the number of science Nobels science, um, come together at about 0.67, so you also have a general factor, a general factor which explained 66% of why it was that countries varied uh, in, uh, in, in, in basically Nobel Prizes and in, in Science Nobel Prizes and in, um, <clears throat> and in scientific publications. And what we then did was we controlled, to some extent, for intelligence. We only looked at countries that had an uh, IQ of above, uh, an average IQ of above 90, uh, and we... Um, in doing this, of course, that's 98% of, of countries that have ever won Nobel Prizes. But anyway, that, we, we, that, that control was inserted. And what we find then is a correlation of about 0.5 between our testosterone factor, our androgen factor, and per capita science Nobel Prizes. So what this is showing is that that once you control for intelligence, and that's what you're doing with genius, with the genius type, let's, get, let's control for intelligence. Yes, they will be intelligent. We know that. Once you control for intelligence, then what you're dealing with is people that have um, high levels of testosterone, basically. Um, and that is the motivating force. That is the thing that is causing them, that's making them competitive, that's making them driven, uh, that's making them autistic, that's making them psychopathic, that's making them all of these things which come together to, to make you the genius. Now, we would expect um, this to be relevant to baldness as well, because testosterone correlates with going bald via the, the level of what's called DHT. 
uh, and the testosterone damage causes damage to the hair and therefore gradually the hair stops growing. And there are many, many, many studies that you will find that replicate this again and again and again, that men who um, are who are higher in testosterone markers and whatever are more likely to go bald and to go bald young. And so my suspicion would be that what you would find if we, you were to look into it uh, and put in the relevant controls and so forth would be that there would be a correlation between genius and baldness. By the way, we also did another paper, uh, Van der Linden, myself and Guy Madison, where we looked at... Um, the relationship between national level schizophrenia and left handedness uh, and Nobel Prizes. And we found it was a negative correlation of about 0 0.5, um, 0 0.5 in the case of schizophrenia. Um, and so basically, and, and uh, left handedness was positive. So well, again, when controlling for intelligence, you find that the more left handed a society is, the more likely it is to produce geniuses. Why? Because left handedness is an expression of testosterone. Uh, people who have higher testosterone levels are more likely to be left-handed. Left-handed people are on average more psychopathic, more autistic, and just generally more violent. Um, in uh, Currently in Western societies, about 12% of people are left-handed. Among the extremely violent Yanomamo of Venezuela, this tribe, it's about 25% according to what hand they hold their spear with. So this is showing you the importance of testosterone. But again, testosterone crosses over with, with baldness. It, the DHT, it, um, it, it damages the androgen receptor follicles, and so gradually men who are high in testosterone will lose their hair. And men who are very high in testosterone will tend to lose their hair young. And so what I would expect to find um, is uh, it would be very complicated to look into it. I would need to have photographs controlled for age of, let's say, every Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and then I would need to have a specific, because there's ways that there's official ways that you, you, you measure the level of baldness. Uh, and you'd need to have that, and then you'd and then you'd need to correlate the the information. It would be quite a big job, but um, so it may be considered a, a, a bad thing for a chap to go go bald. Uh, but the positive side is that um, if he is going bald, it may well be the case that he's uh, more likely to be uh, a genius type. Um, so I just thought I would uh, share that with you. Oh, and happy Easter. Hello, hello, hello! The Jolly Heretic is an online public house which meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 7pm UK time, 2pm New York, in which we discuss the kind of based, fearless science which is increasingly expunged from our woke, joke universities. If you would like to help the Jolly Heretic public house, and there are many ways you can do so, please, please, please become one of my patrons on Subscribestar. Also, if you want to, you can donate to the channel uh, using Odyssey and Entropy, and you can also purchase Jolly Heretic merchandise, such as uh, shirts, and mugs. All of the links are in the description. Again, I'd be most violently grateful if you could assist the Jolly Heretic Public House, and I will see you all soon, and goodbye!